Okay, recording. Hi, everybody. This is Lauren Peretti with Housing Innovations. Thank you for joining us this morning for our path monitoring uh, webinar. So before we get started, I'm just going to do a couple of housekeeping things. Um, I'm here today with Shannon Quinturin from the Housing Innovations team and all also over to Brenda in just a moment to do some uh, introductory uh, remarks. But before I do that, I'm going to just go through some housekeeping stuff. So um, the first thing is that our slides for today, as well as the monitoring guide that we're going to be talking about that's been updated for um, 2021, are posted to the CT Boss website. Shannon is also going to uh, get those documents into the chat window in just a minute, so you can also access them from there if you prefer. We are recording the session this morning, so uh, that recording will be posted to the CT Boss website within the next few days for anyone that wasn't able to join um, and, and, wants to, and wants to watch. Everyone is muted when you first join, although we absolutely invite you guys to unmute yourselves and ask questions at any time throughout the webinar this morning. You can unmute um, either by, if you've joined us by phone, by using star six, um, or if you've joined us by Zoom, there's a little microphone icon next to your name in the participants window, and you can click on that to mute and unmute. We do ask when you're not speaking to please mute yourself back so that we don't have a lot of background noise, which can be um, make it hard for others to hear. Um, so we are scheduled to end today at 11.30. We will absolutely end by 11.30. I promise not to keep you on longer. We may end earlier than that, um, depending upon how many, how many questions folks have and how long it takes us to get through the content. That, um, turn it over to Brenda. Great, thank you, Lauren. Hey, everybody. It's nice to see some of you. I think I can see most of you. Um, I just wanted to say a quick hello and thank everybody for their hard work. It's been such an insane year. If you think back to the last time we did this webinar a year ago, how different our lives are. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I want to make sure that I'm communicating to you. There's been a couple of little changes um, with how SAMHSA gave us some funding this year, which you've, you've been getting my emails. Um, Connecticut was lucky to get some additional training and technical assistance funds for PASS, which has been fantastic. So we passed that through to Housing Innovations so that they could build on their training and technical assistance that they're offering you for the next year. So you've been probably getting emails to set up some TH time, kind of in some slides. Um, to get some feedback from all of you on some ideas um, how you might like to see that technical and training technical assistance and training funds used um, but because we were able to kind of reallocate some of that new money to housing innovations to do training and technical assistance we were able to free up some of their i guess original um, past funding and that's how we were able to do that supply fund so again we um, to keep it short and sweet and not have to go through amendments and contracts we must kind of pass that on to Housing Innovations as well to set up that supply fund. So you've probably been hearing from them, signing MOUs, and working out um, that order to start getting those supplies done. So we're very lucky. Connecticut was able to get that extra money from SAMHSA for PATH, and so we could kind of move some things around. We're hoping with that supply fund that you're able to really um, ramp up your purchases for PPE. I know numbers are going back up in Connecticut. Um, this is such an essential program to take out there in Canvas as much as you possibly can. Um, so please take advantage of that supply fund and make sure that you're getting anything you need for cleaning and for health and safety. That would be great. Um, I think that's all I have for quick updates. If you can just send me a quick email if you're on this, I think, just in case I see phone numbers on here. I just want to make sure all of our PATH providers are on this call. Actually, I think I see everybody. Oh, just a couple phone numbers. So just send me a quick email so I know that you're on this webinar. And I'm here. I'll be here with you through the whole webinar. So if there's any questions specifically for DMS, please just jump in and ask. 
Um, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit later as we go on through the presentation. All right, and I'll send it back to Shannon. To me. Thanks. Oh, to Lauren. Sorry. I knew. I'm like, I have 50 50 chance. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, Brenda. Um, so, all right. So, this is our agenda for today. Bef whoops. Sorry. This is our agenda for today. Um, so, before I jump in and review the agenda, just for anyone that's new, I just always want to be mindful that we're just giving quick overview orientation for anyone that's new. So, um, so DEMIS is required by SAMHSA to do annual monitoring of PATH projects. Um, and so Housing Innovations, um, the organization that Shannon and I work for, we are the consultants to DEMIS for PATH monitoring. And we originally started DEMIS, uh, started helping DEMIS with um, monitoring back in 2017. So we developed the original uh, monitoring standards with input from you guys back in 2017 and we started monitoring projects in 2017 so this will be the fourth year 2021 will be the fourth year that um, that housing innovations is is helping Demis to uh, you know is monitoring projects on behalf of, of Demis um, so at this point all projects have been monitored um, multiple times, although not every project had the full monitoring in 2020, which we'll talk about uh, a little later. So this is our agenda for today. Um, we're just going to do a real quick overview of um, what our goals are, why we monitor. Um, we're going to talk about some new tools that we've developed to help uh, you guys be able to understand what the standards are that we use when we come out to monitor and to meet those standards. And we're also just going to do a quick reminder about what all of the existing tools that um, we've developed over time are. We're going to talk really quickly about the um, 2021 uh, point in time count. Um, we're, and then we're going to spend most of our time together, as we always do every year in this webinar, we're going to spend most of our time together going through what are the changes in the monitoring guide this year. And they're not a ton. Um, and then we're going to talk about a new process. Shannon's going to actually talk about a new process that we're using this year for the first time um, around how we are getting feedback from the people, the consumers, the participants who are being served through PATH projects. Um, and then Shannon's also going to um, talk about um, the, a little bit more in detail, the technical assistance that Brenda just mentioned that's uh, now available through these supplemental funds that Demis was able to get from SAMHSA. And as I said, we will definitely pause at the end to make sure we've answered any questions that folks have, but please don't feel like you have to wait till the end, you know, jump in at any time, either in the chat or unmute yourselves to ask questions. All right, so before we jump in, we, I just wanted to take a moment to say, as Brenda just said, right, we see you, we know that this is super tough work every year, right, Do working with, um, you know, folks that are unsheltered, it's very hard work, and you guys are now doing that in the midst of a pandemic and in the midst of whatever you have going on in your own personal lives as a result of all the disruption that we are all facing because of the pandemic. And so we just wanted to take a moment before we start to acknowledge that and to invite you guys to breathe. Right? It's so important always um, when we're doing this hard work, but particularly now, uh, that everyone take the time that they need to, to be kind um, to themselves and to and to take step back and take a breath every every once in a while. Thank you, Lauren, for starting off with the deep breath. <laughs> you are welcome, and I invite you at any point today when we're monitoring you, when you're on technical assistance calls, never never hesitate to say, you know what, I just need a need a minute to breathe. We will always honor and appreciate that. So I will. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so, um, so these are the goals for PATH monitoring um, in the state of Connecticut. I'm not going to go through these things in detail because they haven't, they haven't changed, but I am just going to say that given what we just talked about, right, like how difficult this work is, it's really our goal at Housing Innovations, as well as uh, Brenda and, you know, the whole team's goal um, at DEMIS, to, to support you guys, right? So that together, like monitoring is absolutely not about, like it's not a gotcha thing, right? It's a way that we can together decide what does really high quality outreach look like, right? Where are we 
Um, where are we already you know, there or maybe even beyond there, exceeding the expectations? Where have our, is our practice maybe not aligned with those standards? And how can we support each other to make practice as closely aligned um, with the standards as possible? Ultimately, because all of us share the goal of ending street homelessness in the state of Connecticut. So that is what this is. That is what this is about. And so it really is an opportunity for us to learn together about what works both locally and nationally um, to create some standards around that and then to, to get practice as far advanced as we can towards that understanding that the resources are limited, right? You guys have had historically very limited resources um, to do this very difficult work. And I think, you know, just the good news that's on the street about the DOH um, RFP, right? So there, there is, people probably know, um, DOH released an RFP, the proposals were due back in October, and that's a million more dollars over the next two years to fund this incredibly important work um, through the ESG coronavirus Fun. So we are super excited about that. We hope you guys are excited, um, excited about that too. So each year when we, um, you know, when, before we start monitoring, we take a look at our monitoring guide and we say, okay, like what have we learned since last year? Like where were things maybe not super clear that we can clarify? Where are there new needs or emerging best practices that we want to integrate into our standards? And then we make updates and then we make updates to the guide. And every can is different, right? So every can, like some of you guys are working primarily in more urban areas where there's a bunch of homeless, you know, unsheltered homeless folks in a fairly small geographic area. And there may be more than one agency providing outreach services. Some of you guys, your whole can really is suburban or rural areas. And in some cases, there's only one person covering any given geographic area within that, within that can. And so we get that. And so the monitoring guide is not necessarily, everything that's in there is not necessarily either one going to make sense for every PATH program or two, given resources, be feasible for every PATH program. Right, so there's always the opportunity every year for you guys to look at what the standards are and to say, hey, either this thing doesn't make sense for us, right, because of the way that our like unsheltered homeless, where, you know, where people are and how unsheltered homelessness looks in our particular community, or it's just not feasible. Like we would love to be able to do this, but we can't. It's not feasible given the, the resources that we have. And in either of those two circumstances, you could always go to Brenda and, and explain that. And then Brenda, you know, can decide if to waive the requirement. And so if that happens and you've gotten a waiver for Demas on any of the requirements, um, then you just want to document that so that when Housing Innovations comes out to monitor, we're not going to monitor you on a standard that Brenda has waived. Right, so just that's been the case always since we started to do that. But I like to remind people about that every um, every year, and particularly because we've got um, I think always at least a few new folks in the room. The other thing to keep in mind is that some of the things in the guide are really best practice recommendations. They are not requirements, and those things are noted in the guide as best practice recommendations. So for those things, if you don't think they make sense or you can't do them because you don't have the resources, you don't have to get a waiver because they're not required anyway. So just be mindful of that as you go through um, the things that are in the guide. Okay. So this next slide shows what are all the tools that we have developed since 2017 to help you guys understand what's in the guide and to help you guys meet the requirements that are in the guide. Um, and I'm gonna talk primarily about two new things that we, or actually one new thing that we developed um, this year. Shannon is later on in the webinar gonna talk about the new standardized statewide consumer survey and the process that we're gonna use for that. So I'm not gonna go into detail about that now. But I did wanna say that we, um, this is one of the things that I think uh, we've heard folks ask for over the years, is we created this document um, that goes through in detail, what are all the documentation requirements for the PATH projects, right? So it's broken into, three sections, Shannon posted it in the chat. So if you wanna open it up and look at it while I'm talking, please feel free. It's also on the CT Boss website. 
Um, but it's broken into three sections, right? The first section is about what are the documents that are required for individual participants, right? So what are the things that you should have in a participant's chart, right? And it breaks participants into three different groups. So it's participants who are enrolled in PATH and are getting full case management services, right? It's participants who are enrolled in PATH but are not getting full case management services, right? Because you've determined that you don't have enough case management resources to be able to provide full case management to everyone. And you've proposed that and it's been approved in your outreach plan. And then there's the third group is folks that you have contacted but not enrolled in PATH, either because they're not eligible or you're not sure yet whether or not they're eligible. And so for every document, so for example, it'll say service plan, and then it'll say a service plan is required only for people enrolled in getting full case management services, but not for people enrolled in not getting case, full case management services, and not for people who are not enrolled but have just been contacted, right? So it goes through literally every document that um, is required and says which of those three for, for which of those three cohorts of clients is that document required. The second section in the document goes through, it's a checklist, and it goes through all of the policies that are required for PATH projects. So for example, you've got to have confidentiality policy, you've got to have a conflict of interest policy, right? It goes through all of those things. And then it goes through other kinds of documents that are required that are not policies, right? So that's things like you've got to have your outreach plan approved every six months, right? You've got to have uh, documentation that your outreach staff have gotten at least 12 hours of, um, of training per year. So those are just some examples. Um, please check it out. We hope it will be helpful. Um, even for folks who've been through monitoring a bunch of times before, but to have it kind of all in one place and kind of an abbreviated, easy to use format, I hope, um, what, what, all the, what all the requirements are. And certainly if you're new to all this, um, I think it will be helpful. We are always with all of this stuff, like again, our goal is to make this as easy as possible for you guys. So if you ever have any ideas about how it could be formatted different or different information that it could be on there, or please just let me or Shannon or Brenda know, um, we're always um, willing to, to, to make changes to the tools um, to make them as helpful as possible for you guys. We're also always willing to develop new things. So if there are guidance, tools, whatever that we have not already developed that you would like us to develop, just let us know and um, we'll work with Brenda to get it into the, our development into our development pipeline and get it out to you guys as soon as we can. So the rest of the things on this slide, we've got, um, these are not new, so hopefully people are familiar with them. It's the outreach plan template that you guys are now required to use. There's also, we developed maybe a year or six months ago, a sample outreach plan. So if you're ever filling out your outreach plan and you're not sure like what it is you were asking for in a particular area, you can consult with that sample. It's basically an example of a completed outreach plan. Um, we've got the assessment and, um, and service planning tool that's required only for folks that are getting full case management services. And then we've got that housing placement um, and housing target tracking tool. Um, and that's available for you guys if you want to use it, but not, but not required. Um, and all of these things are at the link in the bottom of the screen on the CT Boss, uh, CT Boss website. All right, oops, sorry. Having technical difficulties with Zoom today. Okay, so, um, so just wanted to really quick, I always like to take a minute um, during these webinars to just celebrate the tremendous success that your teams have had in the state of Connecticut um, as evidenced by the reduction in street homelessness over time. So um, we obviously don't have data yet for the 2021 pick count, but we knew, do know that from 2007, until 2020, in large part thanks to the hard work of you guys, the state of Connecticut um, was successful at reducing unsheltered homelessness by 60%. So kudos to everyone for that. Um, we do know that there, uh, we do have a pit count date for 2021. It's January 26th, 2021. We do know for sure that the sheltered count will proceed as usual. And the um, information that we gather, we've already started gathering for the housing inventory chart, that will proceed as usual. 
Um, HUD released in typical HUD fashion, very late in the game, guidance on Friday um, that provided communities with flexibility, uh, understanding that it may just not be feasible for communities to do what they've typically done. It might not be feasible, it might not be safe for communities to do a typical unsheltered count. And so they've given uh, communities a whole bunch of different possibilities for, um, for the unsheltered count. And our uh, friends, our partners at CCH um, that manage all of this stuff for the state of Connecticut, they are hard at work trying to digest that guidance and uh, come up with a plan that makes sense for, for Connecticut. So that's all to say we don't know, unfortunately, what's happening yet with the unsheltered count, um, but CCH is on it and we'll get that information out to you guys ASAP. I will say it's not going to look like, it's definitely not going to look like what it typically looked like, right? It's not going to be the same thing that we normally did. It's going to be, there's going to be some major, um, some major adjustments I think you can anticipate. So, all right. So I mentioned this quickly before. Normally when we do this webinar every year, Shannon and I share some um, of the common findings that we saw when we went out and we visited PATH projects the year before. Um, this year, coronavirus happened. I don't have to tell you guys. Um, and that happened right when we were at the very early stages of doing 2020 monitoring. And so Demas made the decision that you guys had enough on your plates, right? You did not need to add monitoring um, in, the, you know, in the early stages of the pandemic when you were frantically trying to figure out how to keep your staff and your clients safe, monitoring should not be a priority. And so we canceled the kind of in-depth monitoring that housing innovations typically does we had already done three projects before coronavirus happened, and the rest, what Demas did for the other five, because as I said earlier, they are required to do this by SAMHSA, um, Brenda did very modified kind of brief monitoring for the other five. So we don't have common findings from 2020 because it was a really very apples to oranges process for the three, three projects that got the full monitoring and the five projects that did not. Um, so we will certainly share findings from this year's monitoring um, when we convene when we convene again. So um, so basically, the main difference between what we're going to do in 2021 and what we have done in the past is that all of the 2021 monitoring visits are going to be remote, and I'm going to talk more in detail about that. I think on the next on the next slide. Um, but otherwise, monitor, and many of you have already been monitored remotely, so there really is going to be very little difference for you guys that have already been monitored remotely. Um, but otherwise, the monitoring process is going to look the same as it has, right? So we'll send you a letter via email, right, that proposes a date that we're going to um, do the remote monitoring. And in that letter will be all sorts of instructions about what you have to submit to us in advance and every all the details that you'll need to know will be included in that in that notification. Um, and then you'll send us a bunch of stuff in advance, like some policies and um, some participant chart documents. Um, we'll meet on Zoom. Um, for the entrance conference. And then, you know, our team will, you know, basically work independently throughout the course of the day, reviewing all the stuff that you've provided for us. And then we'll convene again at the end of the day for the exit conference to tell you guys, um, you know, what we found so that when you get the report, there are no surprises. And so that you guys can tell us what if we miss something, right? So that's a big part of why we do the exit conferences because we want to make sure that um, the findings that are in the in the final report that you get are are accurate, and we didn't make a mistake, right? So, um, so outreach observation. Obviously, we're not going to do that because we're going to be doing these remotely. So that we won't do this year. A staff interview. We will interview one of your um, outreach staff. We'll do that on Zoom. And the consumer interviews. Those are always like at the discretion of a consumer, right? If you have a consumer who wants to talk to us and has a way that you can arrange to talk to us on Zoom, we will do that. Um, but if not, that's, it's fine, because we know that that might be hard to get somebody to do, particularly on Zoom. So, um, so after uh, the date of the monitoring, Shannon and I will write up a draft report. We'll send you that draft report. You'll tell us if we got anything wrong, we made any mistakes. 
Um, we'll make any revisions, we'll issue the final report, and then there's certain criteria that are outlined, they're the things that are in pink on the guide, that if you had a finding in that area, um, Demas wants you to do a follow-up plan. So you'll submit a follow-up plan to us, um, and that's basically the same process that we've used over the past four years, so um, not much has changed there. Um, and also the way that we will handle remote monitoring for anyone who's been monitored remotely before is going to pretty much be the same too, but um, some of you guys have not been monitored remotely uh, before, so I'll just go through real quickly what those things are. Um, I will say that we've been doing remote monitoring for a few years now, and um, I think every agency, we always ask the agencies that have done it, you know, what they thought about it, if they liked it, how they thought it compared to in-person monitoring. And I think pretty much across the board, everyone has always said that they like it better than in-person monitoring, um, that they find it to be more efficient and less burdensome. Um, and so, um, and so it's, been, it's been very well received. So that's to say, if you haven't been monitored remotely before, don't worry, it'll be fine. It's really pretty easy. Um, so, so when we do remote monitoring, one of the things that we do is because we really are trying to make it uh, as unburdensome as possible for you guys, and we don't want to have to have you submitting a ton of client records. So what we do is we focus only on things, because you've all been monitored before, we focus only on things where there was a where there was a finding on your last report or where there's a new requirement, right? So it'll be less extensive um, than an on-site than an on-site monitoring. And so, basically, what happens is you guys give us a list of all the participants that you served over the past 12 months, and then a few days before the monitoring date, we send you a version of that list back that says, okay, we're gonna look at the following documents for these you know, three or four participants, right? For, for participant A, we're gonna look at the service chart, the assessment, and the releases of information, right? For participant B, we're gonna look at anything related to the circumstances around the discharge and any aftercare notes that you did after the person was discharged, right? So we'll tell you exactly what it is we're gonna look for on each client, and then you guys, the, the most common way that people have done this, and it's worked really well, it's super easy, um, is that you then pull those documents, and it won't be a long list, I promise, we try to keep it as short as possible. You pull those documents from whether it's your paper charts or your electronic charts, um, and you scan them and you upload them to the client's HMIS record. Shannon and I log into your HMIS, You've got to give us permission. We'll give you all the instructions about how to do that. Um, and then we review them there. The other possibility is that if you've got, your agency has an electronic health record system that is not HMIS and you are, your IT department is able and willing to give us temporary remote access to that system, we can also um, review documents directly in your electronic record system. Um, the last option, and we really discourage this because it's a pain in the butt for you guys, is if you don't want to do either of those things and you prefer to redact all confidential information from the records and then submit those via email and Dropbox, you can, but that's hard to do and it's so easy to do in HMIS, um, we, we discourage you from choosing that option. All right. So now we are going to talk about what are the changes to the monitoring guide um, in 2021. And they're really uh, just a couple areas where things have changed. The first thing is that we've changed, and I'm gonna go through detail on each of these things, or Shannon and I together are going to. We've changed the levels of service section of the report. Um, we've added some new standards on race equity and consumer involvement. Um, there's one very simple new standard related to the outreach plan, and then there's a new section related to emergency preparedness and response, including infection control protocols. So um, also new in 2021 is before, when, when, when we tell you that, um, you know, we, we send you a notification that says we're going to come out and monitor you, one of the things we ask you to submit is a list of all the 
participants that you've served in the last 12 months, both people who are currently enrolled in the PATH project and people who've been discharged from the project in the past 12 months. And in the past, <clears throat> most agencies have generated that list out of HMIS, but not everyone, right? So some agencies are generating that list manually. And so this year, um, that will no longer be allowed. So you, we will not accept lists that are generated manually. So those lists need to be generated out of HMIS. Um, and we're also asking folks to generate the same list out of DDAP so that that way we can see, do the list match, right? And are there maybe some data quality concerns either in HMIS or in, or in, or in DDAP. So that's the purpose of this. I'm not gonna go through all the instructions for how to do this. Um, there's a link here on the slide and we will send you the instructions um, when, when we notify you about, about monitoring, but it should be, should be fairly, fairly straightforward. Okay, the next thing that changed is that we made some changes to the section of the report um, around levels of service. And so the purpose of this section of the report is to look at what were your contract commitments, right? So in your IUP, how many people did you say that you were gonna contact during the year? And how many people did you say that you were gonna enroll in PATH during the year? Versus what you actually did, right? And so we've divided this section into, um, into uh, we've divided this table into two sections to make sure that it's an apples to apples comparison, right? So in the first column, you've got the current contract year. So the current PATH contract year started on September 1st, and it ends on August 31st, 2021. And so in this column, we're just going to say what the contract commitments are, right? We don't know what the actuals are yet because the year's not over, right? But we'll just say what the current year contract commitments are. And the reason for that is that there has been some confusion. Staff in the outreach programs are not always clear about what those contract commitments are, and we want to make sure that everybody's super clear about what the target is, right? The second set of this table, all the things, the columns to the right, those are looking, those are looking at the most recent completed contract year. So that's 9119 to 83120. So there we know both what the contract commitments were and what the actuals were. So for example, let's say your IUP said you were gonna enroll 100 participants in PATH during the last um, contract year. And when we run the HMIS report, you've only got 50 people enrolled, right? And then when we roll the DDAP report, when we run the DDAP or you run the DDAP report, you've only got 25 people enrolled, right? So you're short um, on both of your commitments and there are probably some data entry issues because the two reports don't match, right? And so those differences will be shown in the column all the way, all the way to the right. Um, does that, I'm gonna pause for a minute and just see, no one's asked any questions yet. I don't see anything in the chat, but does anyone have any questions before I keep going? Don't all speak at once. Okay, I'm gonna keep going, but please feel free to interrupt if you have questions. So this um, next set of slides that we're gonna go through are really um, in detail the changes that are in um, the standards in the guide. And so um, there's a whole new section on emergency preparedness and response. Um, all of the other sections of the guide, the sections themselves are the same. Um, there are a couple of minor changes within those sections and Shannon will talk about those things. Um, so for emergency preparedness and response, excuse me, obviously in light of the coronavirus, right, we all can appreciate and respect how important it is to be prepared at any given time for some sort of emergency situation to emerge. Um, so always when we add new standards to the guide, we understand, Brenda Demas understands that um, these are new standards, right? And so in the first year, you might not have these things because they weren't required until now, right? Um, but a lot of agencies, I think, already had emergency preparedness and response plans. And so if your agency already has one of these, um, you know, you'll submit it and we'll look at that plan against the standards that are outlined in the guide and we'll give you feedback about places where the plan is not aligned with the standards that are 
um, that are in the guide. And I'm not going to go through all these things. I'm just going to highlight all the details are in the guide. Many of the details are here on the slides, but I'm, I won't read them all to you. Um, I'll just give you a sense of the kinds of things we're going to be looking at. So, for example, um, every agency is different in terms of what kinds of emergencies are most likely to occur. Right, so if my agency, like our offices are in a low lying area or, you know, we're located in the floodplain of a river, right, we're likely to, we're not, maybe not likely to flood, but of all the horrible things that could happen, a flood is one that's going to be more likely for my agency than for another agency, right, if we're located in the evacuation zone of a nuclear power plant, right, so we want to see that your um, plan has done a risk assessment of what are the kinds of emergencies that are most likely to impact your, your agency. We also want to know, we know that one of the most important things in a crisis is really prompt and clear and consistent communication, right? Because without that, the rumor mill goes wild. People are getting all sorts of inaccurate information and everyone is in a panic. Right, so a communication plan is really essential for that the information that everyone acting, is acting from is current and accurate. And so we we'll wanna make sure that your plan, for example, assesses like who are the target audiences that need information in a crisis, your staff, your clients, the public maybe, um, and who's responsible for determining what the message should be and getting that message out to all of those different target audiences. Um, we will also look to make sure, um, as an example, right, like we've all been part of planning processes, I know I've been a part of many, um, where you, you know, write this plan, maybe you get some pretty desktop publishing, it looks really nice, and then it sits on a shelf and gathers dust, right? And no one ever looks at it again, and no one knows what's in it, and it's not actually incorporated into your day-to-day -day practices of what you do at the agency, right? So one of the things we'll look at is that in the plan itself, is there a, is there a mechanism to make sure that the plan is, um, you know, periodically reviewed and updated um, to keep it a living, breathing, current, current document. Um, we'll also look um, to see whether or not, um, oh, sorry, I'm on the, the so this, so, so the, I didn't go through all the things on the emergency preparedness plan, um, but you can look at the details in the guide. So this next set of slides looks at infec infection control practices. So um, for these things, again, right, new requirement, you may not have all this stuff written down. Um, and particularly here, because we obviously are still in the midst of the, of the COVID pandemic, we're going to be more concerned about whether or not you're actually doing these things than we are about whether or not you've written them all down. Although at some point, it will be required, right? It is it, like having a written infection control protocol um, is a requirement. And so you should write them down as soon as you can. But in the meantime, we're, we'll, we'll, if you have such things written down, you can submit those written documents to us and we'll review them. But if you don't, we'll have a way for you guys to report what you're actually, what you're actually doing so that we know, um, even if it's not written down, that you are in practice doing these things. And so, um, and so like, for example, again, I'm not gonna go through all this stuff, just a couple quick examples. We'll look at, were you able, are you currently, maintaining outreach services to, um, to your clients throughout the course of the pandemic. If you weren't able to do that, you know, what, how long were, were, were you not doing that, right? Um, we'll also look at things like um, patient, right? What's your protocol for ensuring that someone on your team is monitoring the most current information that's coming out of the CDC, that's coming out of the State Department of Health or your local health department, um, that's being put, put out by your COC, right? Who's responsible for monitoring that, for filtering it to make sure that, um, you know, the most relevant information is then getting out to the people in your outreach program that need it, the clients, the staff, et cetera. Lauren, can I ask a uh, Lauren, yeah. I, so yeah. as far as the response plan, I know some of us have it already and some of us don't. 
right? Yeah. So I would consider COVID-19 to need a plan of its own because it's a crisis. So will this plan take place of us waiting for any direction from you guys if, say, if we were to go into quarantine? Are we still waiting from direction from you or should we just follow what that, what, what that plan is? Good question. So the standards are already, the standards are already in the manual, in the, in the guide, in the modern guide. So if you don't have already written uh, infection control protocols, both for COVID-19 and also because a lot of the stuff that would be in an infection control protocol is going to be relevant for other similar kinds of, of infectious diseases, right? So it's certainly relevant for things like influenza. It's relevant, you know, maybe for other kinds of like TB. Some of it might be relevant for things like HIV, right? So you want to have this. Um, and then you also want to have, you know, specific protocols for obviously for, for the pandemic, but all the requirements are already in the guide. So the first priority should be, I think, if you're not already doing these things, is figuring out, you know, which of these things is most important to be done and doing them. And then the second step is getting it all written down. Okay, so, you're, so you should not be waiting on additional guidance from us before you do this. Everything that, uh, you know, what, what the requirements are, what we're looking at is, is already um, written, out, written out in the guide. Okay. Um, this, is, this is Brenda. I just wanted to add something as well, just as far as um, if there is quarantining or, you know, the governor's making any announcements um, about changes as far as quarantine, isolation, any of that. Um, just remember early on, the DEMAS commissioner did send out some guidance that the understanding is DEMAS funded programs will continue business as usual unless your agency submits a plan to my commissioner's office requesting that that changes. So just to keep that in mind, um, you can't just stop canvassing or shut the program down or send everybody home to make phone calls instead of canvassing unless you get a plan approved by the Demas Commissioner's Office. Thanks, Brenda, for that important. Um, and so just a couple other, right, so again, I'm not going to go through all of this. The details are in there. Um, but another example of something that we would look for in an infection control protocol is, you know, what training and support um, are you providing to staff to help them navigate when they're working, whether it's with people in the public or with clients, um, you know, folks that don't want to comply with the risk reduction strategies, people that are refusing to wear a mask, people that don't want to be tested, people that maybe don't want to eventually get the vaccine, right? Like, what are our intervention strategies for helping people to have a harm reduction approach just the same way we would any other risk, right? It's not just saying, oh, well, they don't wanna be tested, so that's, you know, they're, obviously we're not forcing people to be tested, but how are we supporting staff to use those motivational building strategies, for example, um, to help people accept the risk reduction um, strategies that are necessary to help them, to help them stay, stay safe. Um, another example would be, um, how, you know, what protocols do you have in place for guidance on how and when to use cloth face coverings versus medical grade PPE um, for your staff? You know, what protocols do you have in place to make sure that you're partnering with medical uh, partners in the community um, to make sure that you've got a strategy for uh, testing? Um, for both clients and, and staff. So those are just some examples. All right, um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Shannon and she's gonna lead us through the rest of our slides. Hi everyone, the guide is race equity and consumer involvement. This is again, like as Lauren indicated, a best practice. So how we wanna um, frame this is maybe ask ourselves some questions questions of how we're working in our program. How do we have the people working, our staff at our agencies, um, reflect the diversity that we see in our program participants? What have we actively done to promote that? 
and we want to look at what the racial and ethnic makeup of a city, town, region can, um, where that which is served by your project. Do we does our staff reflect that makeup? Do we have staff that speak the languages that are most often smoke, spoken in our can or our region? And does our board look like the makeup of our can? Um, do the projects give thought and and then take action to make all staff feel welcome and provide opportunities in an equitable way among the diversity of staff? Uh, what types of opportunities do we give our program participants and others with lived experience of homelessness to provide um, input and make changes in our programs? Do we have a consumer advisory board? Do we have listening sessions for our consumers? And if we do those things, what actions do we take? What steps are in place to take actions and follow up on those suggestions? Is there any type of formal process in place for, and is, are those things acted upon? Um, and, and just an, an idea, so there's some excellent examples lately in some youth homeless programs. I, um, there's a homeless um, podcast, Changing the Conversation, that I've heard some really good resources on consumer involvement in. Next slide. Again, and again, we're looking at actions that were taken in the last 12 months here. So there are already some people and agencies doing this work in our communities. Has your agency been able to partner with any, um, any of those organizations that are making strides to work with marginalized populations? Has your agency looked at your data to determine if it shows disparity in who gets access to housing or who has better outcomes? That maybe there are people who are a certain um, group that have better exits to permanent housing. Do, do you look at that in your data? Um, and then if and when you do look at that data, if it shows disparities, what actions have you taken? taken to correct that. Next slide. Outreach and engagement. Um, so when we, you have all been working on your outreach plans, you've submitted two different versions now of your outreach plans. And when we come out to monitor, we look at that outreach plan, and then we look at all of the information that you've sent to us, all the information we're reviewing on the day of monitoring, case records, written materials, and we incorporate our discussions with you all um, to see if what you're saying reflects what is written in the outreach plan. Another note about the outreach plan that is, is if you do it, if you've done it, and if you've done it thor a thorough job, there are several items on the monitoring guide, knowledge of the community, outreach plan, strategy for informing the public and response to public concerns, and then outreach provider coordination that are, are we're already going to be able to check the box yes on those monitoring items. Next slide. You know, now more than ever, right? When we developed the outreach plan, it was incorporated that the supervisors would look at it, review it monthly, and make updates as needed. The CAN and DEMAS would approve every six months. Um, now more than ever that I feel like that's important and it's informed, it's, it's informed by some of the things that Lauren has talked about earlier. If you're having um, an emergency plan, having a plan for the pandemic, things are changing so rapidly. We don't need to tell you. Um, Lauren talked about the money that's going to be the additional funding that's going to be coming available for outreach. Um, there's also a new round of ESG money for hotels, motels. Like the resources that are available to you all and the coordination efforts are kind of fluctuating weekly, right? So. So it's really important to look at those outreach plans to know the resources that are available in your area and know the players um, and how that information is going to be distributed to everyone um, and, and update them as needed. And just a reminder that the new plan is due to Demis on March 1st of 2021.
So we've talked to you, uh, Andrea White and I, from Housing Innovations and I have talked to a few providers for the TA um, this, this week already, and we're going to talk to the rest of you between this week and next week. But one thing that has come up is documentation. And I know from being a frontline provider myself, I know from coming out and seeing you all that a lot of times you're so focused on getting the needs met to the people that it's it's challenging to actually write the things down to about the work that you're doing. Um, and one thing that we talked about um, with Andrea is make make it simple. Like don't don't make things more complicated than they have to be. So we what, it's very important to know where and when you meet people uh, so that if there's another person, if for some reason you're not in the office one week, um, maybe for, for a COVID related reason, that the next person in line can pick up the ball and know what's going on with your clients. Outreach clients um, are great at flying below the rain notice and documentation helps, sure, helps ensure that people don't fall through the cracks. Everyone has someone checking in with them. And then to ensure that every unsheltered person is prioritized to be connected with housing quickly. Um, outreach clients are also good at surviving and getting what they need, as you all know, sometimes by continuing to ask every person they see for the same things. So documentation will help avoid um, duplication of services and to conserve the scarce resources that are available. We know that outreach clients also have a very high rate of victimization and trauma, and we know that being predictable and reliable when possible going to the same places every Monday morning, going to the same places every Wednesday afternoon, that when we are dependable, um, that, that's going to be helpful for them. And, and then we're also, um, when we document, we're not forcing people to explain the same things over and over to different people, so we're not re-traumatizing people. Uh, documentation helps establish clear roles and responsibilities and ensure that commitments that are made are kept. They also help us to show progress, uh, not only to ourselves, which is sometimes important, but to the, to the pro program participant. Look, I see you were struggling with this or that. Uh, we, we've received, we've got an ID for you, or we, we've gotten you a bus pass so that you have transportation now. So showing progress to clients as well. Next slide. written policies and administrative requirements. So just a reminder that you only need to submit um, policies you haven't previously submitted or policies you've changed or policies you want us to consider to address previous findings, which is policies that have changed or new policies. So um, if you don't submit new policies, the, the findings will be carried forward from your last monitoring. So uh, it depends on whether you received monitoring in 2020 or if not, it'll be from the 2019. So for example, if on your past report, there was no finding on educational rights and, and services policy item and you haven't changed your policy, you don't have to send that to us. If there was a finding on that item and you don't submit anything new, the finding will be carried forward to your next monitoring session. Next slide. Standardized consumer survey, as Lauren mentioned earlier, we have a version in English and a version in Spanish. It's about 10 questions. There are a few sub questions in there, um, but they're, they're available in SurveyMonkey. Um, there, there are links here. Go ahead, next slide. I think there's a next slide on consume. Yeah, so um, we'll send out the links to the consume, to SurveyMonkey um, surveys in the next few days. Uh, so when you receive them, each of your PATH recipients um, needs to collect consumer survey data from participants and they can either enter the data themselves through the link if, if they have that ability, or we can use, you all can use paper surveys, and then you input the data into SurveyMonkey by March 12th of 2021. 
Some ideas for completing the survey are to text the link to some of your participants who have that ability and have people do it from the phone while you wait. Outreach or bring the link with you on a device if you have that available that a person can complete on their own. Um, think about having somebody who is not, if you're actually filling out the survey with a person, a paper survey, think about having someone who's not, not providing direct care to that individual. It's, it's, a, little, it's a little challenging to get uh, honest results when the person's telling you, you did a good job or, you know, um, and then that might be, they might be fearful that that might reflect something bad if they gave a negative um, review. So you can also offer incentives, offer a person pizza, a cup of coffee, um, something if, if they complete this survey for you. And you could also, it helps to, to show that it's anonymous and, and you, if you're the service provider, is not gonna input the data, maybe somebody else will put it, actually put it into SurveyMonkey. And we at Housing Innovations are gonna look at that data and send out a report to each agency it's also the results are also going to be a good tool for you all to discuss at quarterly meetings what's working what's not working are there actions we want to take for anything that's not working or issues that have surfaces what surfaced when we're doing um the analysis that need to be addressed next just real slide. quick shannon here a couple of things so the, um, yeah. so just to make sure people see that the deadline for this is March 12th, 2021. So you've got a long period of time between now and March to get as you can through any of those methods that, um, that Shannon went through, but that this is now a requirement. <clears throat> this is new this year, right? So instead of us looking at whether or not you did any kind of survey, right? We're going to be looking at whether or not you did this particular survey of your consumers and you and you submitted and you submitted data. Um, there is not because we don't know. I mean, we know that it's hard, right, to get this kind of feedback for always from clients and particularly from clients who lives are, you know, very unstable, that they're unsheltered. Um, you know, folks who are unsheltered. And so we don't know what's reasonable in terms of like what the expectation should be around response rate. Um, and so there's no standard right now for, um, for, for response rate. But once we've gathered all these surveys, then we'll be able to share with you guys the range of response rates. Like one program got 50% of their people, maybe one program only got 5% of their people, right? So that'll be information um, for you guys to understand how your response rate compared with your, with your peers' response rates. So that's it. Technical assistance. So as I said, Andrea and I have been talking to you all through, we talked to three programs this week already uh, about what your needs might be in terms of technical assistance. And I, I wanted to say, uh, as Lauren said already, the monitoring is not a fault finding mission. Certainly the technical assistance is not to find fault with any of your programs. It, it is, it's, um, as something new, something that we didn't expect to be able to be offered, but we can this year. And it's just for you all to tell us what your needs are. How can we be helpful? And Andrea is really the person, Andrea White from our team is going to be the person doing the bulk of the technical assistance. Um, she's a wealth of information, as most of you know. So some of the things we've talked about providing is case conferencing. Um, completion of forms like that documentation issue has come up a couple of times. So how to simplify doing an assessment of service needs, how to simplify doing a service plan, um, prioritization of housing focused case management services, and then how to have those conversations on preparedness for housing um, and how to, uh, how to incorporate warm ha handoffs to housing providers when you're exiting people. Um, and you know, Andrea, she's, she's a clinical social worker. She has expertise in critical time intervention, motivational interviewing, all these different evidence-based practices, <clears throat> excuse me, that she's going to weave into the technical think of ways to take advantage and we've we've already had some ideas from a few of you but we're also flexible if your needs change going forward tell us that 
Yeah. Uh, Brenda, is there something you want uh, to no, say I'll about I'll just this? jump in quickly and kind of second everything that you said. Um, again, Connecticut was really lucky to get these additional training and technical assistance funds, and they are very specific to past providers. So I think, like Shannon's saying, any feedback you can give us if there's um, kind of a gap in training or if you want more agency specific trainings or technical assistance, we've thrown around some ideas of maybe doing supervisor only type trainings versus past worker trainings, um, maybe onboarding process, what do we recommend as a best practice when you bring on a new path outreach worker, um, just different things like that. Case conferencing does keep kind of coming up if that's an area that you find would be helpful. Um, again, as, as we've been saying throughout, you know, PATH is not, you know, it's, there's not a lot of money in PATH, I'll just say that. And so we kind of have to really be as efficient as we possibly can with every dollar. So let's use this to really um, try to take some of the burden and pressure again through just some technical assistance and training, helping you with your outreach plans. Um, I think these individual TA meetings have been good um, to really walk through outreach, walk through maybe your last monitoring. Um, but I don't know if we're ahead of schedule, if there's any questions or if there's any suggestions or thoughts on um, any of these bullets here, just from anybody now, if, if you could think of something that you could use for technical assistance. I'll give the, uh, the 30 seconds of uncomfortable waiting silence. <laughs> well, if not, I mean, certainly feel free to email me. And like Shannon said, if things come up during your technical assistance meetings, I'm sure um, Housing Innovations is going to kind of document all of that and then talk with Demis and we can kind of see what you need. Um, that consumer survey is also a new process that Housing Innovations is implementing. That's also using these additional technical assistance funds. Um, I encourage you to use us, you know, use Housing Innovations, use Demis, let's kind of all work together so we can, um, you know, serve as many clients as we can during these really tough times. Oops, sorry. No, that's okay. Are there any questions? <laughs> I, think that, I think that that's really helpful because there are a lot of times where, I, like now, I don't have any questions, but when I'm in front of a particular person or I'm looking at a specific form, I'm completely lost, and sometimes I can't communicate that through an email the way I would be able to do it via Zoom or on a phone call. So I think it's a great option. Great. You great. can yeah. and we call us. Yep, time. and we thought we could always set up, um, so sometimes it's people talk more when it's agency specific versus larger groups like this where it's multiple agencies. So if that's something, like if you know forms might be something you need help with, maybe set up two meetings, you know, do one this month and next month, just a half an hour check in. Hey, these are the forms. Can we talk through them? I mean, we're open. We're open to anything that will help you guys. <laughs> I just want to make sure people saw in the chat, Brenda posted the link to oh, yeah. the Demis update that has the instructions that she was talking about for how you get approval from the commissioner's office to any co changes you need to make in light of the um, pandemic to your program in case you haven't already done that. So that links in the chat box. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that, Lauren. Just again, um, please remember to do that process. Go through that link. There's an email to the deputy commissioner. Um, share that with your executive director, CEO. Before you guys make changes or stop canvassing, you do have to kind of email and get that approval first. So I think... Was somebody going to ask a question or was that an echo? 
think it was an echo. Okay, so I think if no one has any questions now, um, this is our contact information for me and Shannon and Brenda, and we're always available, right? So if at any time, you know, um, you've got questions, just always, 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 please feel free to reach out. We appreciate your time today. Um, and if there are no more questions, I think we're, we're at the end. All right, so be well. We gift you back 25 minutes in your day. Thank you. Use it, use it to breathe and to be <laughs> kind to yourself. Thank you. Take good care, Thank guys. Thank you. Take care. Bye.